hello everyone uh, welcome to the amit sen gupta memorial program uh, today uh, before we start uh, so the program today uh, is divided into two uh, so, uh, two different aspects the first is the announcement of the fellowship uh, and also a presentation by the previous uh, fellow uh, arendra uh, and the next part is a panel discussion on the issues of intellectual property rights so uh, we will be having a round of uh, uh, you know lena would be moderate lena from msf would be moderating the session uh, and there would be uh, it would be more more like a lively discussion and a conversation on the issue and anyone who would like to pose some questions uh please put it in the q and a uh, we would we would we will pick it up from there and uh, i will now uh, uh give it stop uh, sharing my screen and give it to sarojini who would be uh, starting the session over to you sarojini thanks gaveya uh this is sarojini from uh, jansas abhyan and people self movement and sama before we start i would like to share the tragic news that father stan swami passed away today our father stan swami was working on many issues uh, land rights uh, adivasi rights to name a few it is indeed a black day for our country the death of an unreal 84 old man uh, 84 84 year old man who was imprisoned denied bail not given medical attention in time a patient with parkinsons not even allowed to have a straw to drink this is a cruelty of the highest order rest in power father stan our deepest condolences and i request all of you to remain silent for 30 seconds as gaveya said uh, now i would like to invite you all on behalf of the organizing committee that is sripta narayan shampa sen gupta ragunandan richa alka narayan indranil raman and gaveya of this event that we are organizing on the occasion of uh, dr amit sen gupta's birth anniversary our uh, thanks to news click for all the technical support amit sen gupta a physician health activist scientist a strong advocate of the right to health a fierce critic of the impact of neoliberalism on the health of the people always deeply insightful in his analysis of the global political economy and fearless in speaking truth to power he argued relentlessly about the contesting power structures and for building movement from the bottom up many of you are familiar with his work and his association with the people's self movement and people's science movement amit brought his enormous political organizational and leadership capacity to both these movements he was one of the founders of people's self movement the largest health network in the world jansa sabhyan and many and associated with all india people's science network delhi social forum and bgvs Amit wrote extensively on several issues, uh, varied in fact, universal access to health, and worked on issues of public health, pharmaceutical policy, and intellectual property rights, to name a few. Unfortunately, he left all of us a bit too early in 2018. Since his passing, the Amit Singh Gupta Memorial Lecture and a panel discussion is being organized in his memory every year. and amit sen gupta fellowship was initiated in 2020 20 arjit sen gupta and amit and tripta sen he will speak about it in a while today's program we will have two segments the announcement of the 2021 fellowship award 
and a panel discussion on issues related to IPR, which are very close to Amit. Yeah, in the middle of all the uncertainties and chaos because of the COVID pandemic, I often find myself thinking of Amit, particularly wondering what he would have say or think of the evolving picture of the global health with COVID. I found his responses in his writings. And especially when he said, if you create conditions where infections fester, they will come back to haunt you. Very true. Amit had thought of such situations and warned us about the threats to health at a global scale posed by viral pandemics and epidemics. And he cautioned us not to view these threats as one-off events and prepare for more such challenges to global health because there are structural reasons. He spoke about these in the context of Zika, Ebola, each of which are relevant in today's COVID context. Amit said in his words, I'm saying, while new knowledge will need to be the cornerstone of the battle against the new challenges on global health, this knowledge is sought to be sequestered in a few hands and to be utilized for private interests or the interests of a few powerful countries. He questioned the role played by many international institutions and rich nations, which have done little to transfer technology and build capacity in low and middle income countries for vaccine research and vaccine development. The recent campaign on the patent waiver is a classic example. His comment on the H1N1 pandemic alert a few years ago uh, was followed by the uh, spectacle of almost the entire stock of vaccines against H1N1 being bought up by a few rich countries in advance. The same is likely to be true for rapid diagnostic kits for diagnosis of Zika infection. All countries are at the risk of Zika virus spreading, but the current global power relations ensure that remedies will be available first to the rich and to the powerful. Doesn't it sound so familiar now? Uh, Amit also spoke about solutions. He said, the global responses to viral epidemics and pandemics show a mirror to the iniquity embedded in the system of global governance today. Uh, we cannot anymore fight this battle virus by virus. A global response will need to address the structural failures of globalization, where it unleashes new challenges at a global scale, but poses a response that is not truly international in character. The epidemic, in all probability, will run its course and die down after leaving a trail of death and destruction. This is what he said. Not because we as a global community would have done anything right, but because of the nature of the virus itself. The moot question is, will we have learned anything? Or will it be back to business as usual? These are the questions Amit posed in his writings, which you will find on uh, many, many journals uh, and many uh, portals too. Amit's knowledge, critique and vision are so relevant today than in the past. And that is the reason for organizing committee to come up with this panel to remember his work, which is so topical and relevant to what we are all witnessing today. And I think that will be taking place in the second part. So now I will invite Arjit Sen Gupta to speak about Amit Sen Gupta Fellowship Initiative. Arjit, uh, can you please uh, 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 yes. Uh, so, thank you, Comrade Sarojini, for uh, that wonderful introduction. And uh, again, we should all begin uh, with keeping the memory of Comrade uh, Father Stan Swami in mind, as he has he is the latest victim at the hands of the repressive apparatus of the state. And moving on to the topic at hand. Uh, I'm, I have been invited to talk about uh, the significance and the idea behind the Dr. Amit Sen Gupta Fellowship. The idea behind this fellowship is simple, that it is common, uh, 
common sense says that uh, scientific research is has nothing much to do with society and particularly uh, the contradictions that exist within society but when uh, healthcare is such is being recognized now even among people who are to the right of things as a basic human right because we are facing such a, a dire time of crisis uh, one must realize that uh, the struggle for making health accessible to the large section of people is a very uh, essential is an essential political commitment that uh, we must take up and in that respect this um, fellowship has been introduced so that academic research uh, in health is done in order to make uh, health accessible to the broader number of uh, people especially the working people of the society and uh, before inviting uh, the recipient of the fellowship uh, dr amit singh gupta fellowship 2020 i would uh, like to say that uh, as today is also dr amit singh gupta's birthday so today especially uh, taking into account the situation that we are in the words of another doctor come to mind these words are of dr ernesto che guevara who said that i am not a symbol but i am a member of a crumbling so, uh, crumbling social order as we can see the social order is clearly crumbling and the achievements of people like dr amit sen gupta should not be seen he should not be seen as a symbol but as a member of this society and all his actions should be seen as that of a member of this society in order to change this society and the effort and the struggle for which uh, my father dr amit sen gupta lived and fought uh, is the same as uh, dr che guevara as well whose words i just uh, recounted so um, keeping that in mind i would like to invite uh, harendra the recipient of uh, the dr amit sen gupta fellowship 2020 uh, thank you very much uh, thanks sarijit uh, harendra uh, namaskar hello aap uh, we can hear harendra ha namaste sabhi logon ko mera naam harendra hai main uh, jan swasthya sahyog ganiyari bilaspur chatisgarh pe kaam karta hu और जन स्वास्थ्य अभियान छत्तीसगढ़ का भी मेंबर हूँ थोड़ा सा परिचय अपनी संस्था के बारे में देना चाहूँगा जन स्वास्थ्य सहयोग गनियारी छत्तीसगढ़ के दो जिलों में काम करती है बिलासपुर और मुंगेली जो बिलासपुर है वो कोटा ब्लॉक में हम लोग काम करते हैं और जो मुंगेली है उसके लोरमी ब्लॉक में काम करते हैं जो लोरमी ब्लॉक है वो पूरा ए के अंदर में आता है पूरा ट्राइबल एरिया है जहां हम लोग अपनी हेल्थ फैसिलिटीज पहुंचाते हैं और हम लोग वहां 72 विलेज में काम करते हैं गनियारी में हमारा एक हॉस्पिटल है हंड्रेड बेडेड जहां हम लोग जितने भी हमारे सब सेंटर्स हैं उनका एक रेफरल सेंटर्स है वहां हम लोग सभी लोगों का इलाज करते हैं वहाँ सर्जरी भी होती है और डिलीवरी की भी पर, वो है और मेडिसिन की भी हमारे पास फैसिलिटीज हैं Uh, there would be a translation of harinder's uh, uh, speech so um, uh, welcome everyone uh, i am harinder i am from uh, ganiyari block bilaspur chatisgarh one of the most uh, uh, tribal uh, one of the uh, states of the country where a large majority of the population are tribal and i work with an organization called jansa swasthya sahyog Uh, which is part of people's health movement uh, jan swasthya sahyog works among uh, the most tribal and deprived uh, sections of the community it runs a 100 bedded hospital in the ganiyari block of bilaspur district 
and uh, it provides various kinds of preventive and primary care services along with uh, maternal child health related services and other healthcare needs are catered to the uh, people for their other healthcare needs. जो मेरे को 20 2021 में जो मेरे को फेलोशिप मिली उसमें मेरा रिसर्च टॉपिक था कि ऑल कॉज मॉर्टेलिटी ड्यू टू प्रोटेंटेबल कंडीशन इन बिलासपुर डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑफ छत्तीसगढ़ बिफोर एंड आफ्टर द इमरजेंसी ऑफ कोविड 19 पेंडेमिक फॉर द ईयर 20 और 21 तो इस टॉपिक को लेने का मेरा उद्देश्य यह था कि कि जब पहली बार यह नई परेशानी थी तो उसमें यह देखने को मिल रहा था कि इसमें हेल्थ केयर सिस्टम पहली से हमारा थोड़ा नाजुक है तो इसकी वजह से बहुत सी सर्विसेज बंद हो गई थी और लॉकडाउन की सिचुएशन आ गई थी तो उसमें कोविड इमरजेंसी के कारण कितनी जो बीमारियां हैं उनको हम बचा सकते थे इसके लिए मैं अपने जो सर लोग हैं उनके संग डिस्कस करके हमने ये टॉपिक डिसाइड करा सो माय टॉपिक आई वांटेड टू लुक एट ऑल कॉज मॉर्टेलिटी इन आवर ब्लॉग गनियारी ब्लॉग वेयर आई लुक्ड एट प्री एंड पोस्ट कोविड सिचुएशन uh the health system in our uh, region is not at a great shape so we wanted to see how the health system has responded and tried to avoid uh, deaths with the focus of how many deaths could have been averted in the period and i uh, fine tune the topic based on the discussion with uh, my uh, colleagues at, at the hospital mm -hmm. जब मेरे को ये फेलोशिप मिली तो पहले कभी ऐसा मैंने काम किया नहीं था और इस फेलोशिप में मुझे रिसर्च करने का भी एक मौका मिला क्योंकि हम मैं जब भी जनस्वास्थ्य मतलब जब से जुड़ा वहां तब से हम लोग प्राथमिक उपचार और जो गांव के संग सेवाएं हैं वो देने के लिए और स्वास्थ्य सुविधाओं को बेहतर करने के लिए कम्युनिटी के संग वर्क करते रहते थे और अभी जब ये मेरे को फेलोशिप मिली तो उसमें मेरे को एक अलग से एक ऊर्जा मिली कि जो हम काम करते हैं उसके अंदर कैसे मैं उसको देख सकूं या उस मतलब उस काम को कैसे दूसरों को बता सकूं कि हम लोग ये काम कर रहे हैं और मेरे को खुद भी एक अनुभव मतलब महसूस हुआ कि ये काम करके थोड़ा सा एक अच्छा सा चीज मिलेगा मेरे को और एक रिसर्च करने के लिए मेरे को कभी मैंने ये पढ़ाई करी भी नहीं थी और मेरी स्टडी से भी थोड़ा अलग था और ये मेरे लिए चैलेंजिंग था कि मैं इसको कैसे करूंगा लेकिन जन स्वास्थ्य अभियान और मेरे जो साथी हैं उन लोगों ने मेरे को मोटिवेशन दिया कि हरिन आप इसको कर लोगे करके तो इसलिए एक अच्छा सा मतलब सहयोग मिला मेरे को एक मौका मिला आई हैव नॉट बीन अ रिसर्चर and when i got the fellowship i realized that this gives me a new opportunity to learn new skills and do uh, things which i have not done so far i've been largely involved in community based and outreach based activities trying to improve or mobilize people in improving health system and the fellowship gave me that opportunity to learn research skills and i also got encouragement from my colleagues and uh, friends who helped me shape my research at jss and uh, it has been a great learning for me so far isme ek cheez ye bhi dekhne ko mili ki jo research hai usko kaise aage ko badhate hain aur usme data jo data hai wo kaise usko matlab dusre ko samjhane ke liye mauka matlab samjha pata hai ki ek data matlab data ko hum kaise collaborate karte hain ki kaise wo ek system ko bata sake ki ye cheez yahan par galat hui hai या एडवोकेसी कर सकें कि उस चीज के लेके हम डेटा के बेस पे पहले तो हम केवल डेटा को लेते थे और उसको रिपोर्ट में लगा के अपने जो भी फंडर्स हैं या सपोर्टिव हैं उनको हम देते थे लेकिन उसमें मेरे को उतना ध्यान नहीं आता मतलब उतना हमको जरूरत महसूस नहीं होती थी क्योंकि जो मेरे कलीग्स थे वही रिपोर्ट बना लेते थे लेकिन इसमें मेरे को यह एहसास हुआ कि डेटा का कितना महत्व होता है कि एक स्टडी को देखने के लिए अगर हम किसी के लिए अगर वो स्टडी से किसी को फायदा देना है तो उसको गवर्नमेंट को अगर प्रस्तुत भी करना है तो उसमें डेटा क्या काम करता है तो ये चीज भी मेरे को इसमें सीखने को मिली 
we earlier we used to collect field and program related data and hand over to uh, the officials didn't i didn't realize how important data is through this work i learned what is the significance of data how it can it can identify health system problems and improve uh, health system functioning it has been a th great learning mera jo jo topic hai usse mujhe एक चीज ये देखने को मिली कि जो ये कोविड पैंडेमिक चल रहा था उससे जमीनी स्तर का पता चला कि कोविड के कारण लोगों को कितनी समस्याओं का सामना करना पड़ रहा है कि जब इमरजेंसी उन्होंने एकदम लॉकडाउन कर दिया रात को कि कल से भारत बंद होगा करके और उसमें देखा भी नहीं गया कि हेल्थ सिस्टम पहली सी हमारा सिस्टम पहली सी वैसी चरमराया हुआ था और अचानक सब चीजें बंद कर दी उसमें जैसे ये जो मिडिल लेवल है और या ऊपर अपर लेवल है उनके लिए तो थोड़ा बहुत बचत थी उन लोग कम से कम अपने घरों में राशन रख सकते थे हेल्थ के लिए कुछ रखे रहते थे लेकिन जो जैसे हम जिन क्षेत्रों में हम आदिवासी क्षेत्रों में करते हैं वो सवेरे कमाने जाते हैं और शाम को खान मतलब उनके लिए व्यवस्था हो पाती है शाम के खाने के लिए और सर जिन क्षेत्रों में हम काम करते हैं वहाँ सरकार ने बहुत से पाबंदी भी लगा लगा दी गई है कि जैसे वो एटीआर के अंदर काम करते हैं अचानक मार टाइगर रिजर्व तो उसमें उन लोगों को जो पहले वो बांस का काम कर सकते थे और वो करते थे तो उसमें भी बहुत सी चीजें उन्होंने बंदी कर दी है और जो उनको नरेगा का काम मिलता था वो भी बंद हो गया था लेकिन उसके वजह से अगर अचानक से उन्होंने ये चीजें करी तो उसमें वहाँ और साप्ताहिक बाजार लगते हैं तो उसकी वजह से भी बहुत सी प्रॉब्लम उनकी क्रिएट हो गई थी जिसमें उनके सामाजिक आर्थिक और स्वास्थ्य की पूरी स्थिति चरमरा गई थी so the area where uh, the okay the lockdown that was imposed suddenly uh, had a debilitating impact on the lives of people uh, the people i am talking about in our ganyari district are tribal people who are generally daily work wayjarners and they will work through the day and fi uh, find the resources to feed uh, themselves and this lockdown actually Uh, had a thorough restriction on their uh, work they used to do the markets they used to go to the national rural employment guarantee act where they could get some employment that was also stopped and th there were severe restrictions on their uh, livelihood options and this led to unprecedented uh, trouble in their lives uh, in uh, in their food security situation and access to healthcare फिर जब मैं जब हमने फेलोशिप का काम स्टार्ट करा जब मेरे को फेलोशिप मिली तो जब हम डाटा कलेक्शन के लिए जाते थे तो उसमें शुरुआत के दौर में तो पूरा लॉकडाउन की सिचुएशन थी और उसमें जब भी हम फील्ड में जाते थे तो कोई भी सही तरीके से जवाब नहीं देता था हमको कि उसकी डेथ काहे के लिए हुई है और आपको किसने बताया कि मृत्यु हो गई है तो उसमें भी बहुत सी परेशानियों का सामना करना पड़ा और जो ट्रेवल का था उसमें पुलिस वाले भी हमको जाने नहीं देते थे मतलब बीच में कि आप लोग ऐसे मत जाइए करके और फिर हम लोगों को फिर एसडीएम से परमिशन लेनी पड़ी कि हम हॉस्पिटल वाले हैं और सीएमओ से परमिशन लेनी पड़ी तो उसमें भी बहुत सी परेशानियों का सामना करना पड़ा द प्रोसेस ऑफ डेटा कलेक्शन वाज क्वाइट डिफिकल्ट देयर वर सीवियर ट्रैवल रेस्ट्रिक्शंस इंपोज्ड बाय द अथॉरिटी आई हैड टू टेक परमिशन टू एक्सेस टू द विलेजर्स एंड टॉक टू देम आल्सो देयर वर अ लॉट ऑफ uh reservation regarding sharing uh, the realities from the respondents and the villagers uh phir baad mein jab ye lockdown khola to uske baad humne jo data collection karna chalu kara to jitne bhi data humne collection kara wo jitno ki bhi mrityu hui un logo ke humne ek verbal autopsy kari aur verbal autopsy jitni bhi kari uske liye phir hamare jo jan swasthya sahyog hai usme jitne bhi मतलब तीन मैंने हम लोगों ने एक टीम बनाई थी अपनी जो तीन डॉक्टर से की अलग अलग स्पेशलिस्ट थे जिसमें जो मेरे मेंटर हैं डॉक्टर योगेश जैन और दूसरे जो हमारे हैं वो डॉक्टर गजानन और तीसरी जो है वो डॉक्टर रमनी अटपुरी करके हैं तो इन लोगों का तीनों का पैनल बना के और जितना भी मैं वर्बल टॉपसी करके लाता था उसको मैं उनको दिखाता था कि इसमें मेरे को बताइए कि ये डेथ किसके लिए हुई है तो वो लोगों ने अपने अलग अलग ओपिनियन मतलब रखे हमने एक एक्सेल ड्राइव्स बनाई थी तो उसमें मैं इसको डालता था और वो इसमें मेरे को मदद करते थे तो फिर उसके हिसाब से हमने इसका डाटा कलेक्शन करा और 
उन लोगों के एक्सपर्ट्स जो टीम है उसके व्यूज लिए the data collection could start only after lockdown was uh, re, uh, reduced and uh, the economy opened up and i conducted uh, verbal autopsies came with causes of deaths and consulted my mentors and uh, doctors including dr yogesh jain and uh, they uh, helped me understand what could be the possible causes of deaths and i collected i collated and analyzed all that जो मैंने ये डाटा कलेक्शन करा उसमें ये देखने को मिला कि जो फर्स्ट वेव कोरोना की थी उसमें हम लोगों के क्षेत्र में उतना कोविड नहीं आया था जिसकी वजह से कोविड की डेथ तो नहीं हो नहीं हुई और उसमें लेकिन कोविड की वजह से जो लॉकडाउन हुआ था उसकी वजह से जो बाकी बीमारियां थी उसमें डेथ काफी बड़ी थी और जो हम बचा भी सकते थे जैसे किसी को बीपी की परेशानी थी टीबी की थी और एच आई था शुगर हो गया और सिकल हो गया इन लोगों को क्योंकि हम लोग जहाँ काम करते हैं वहाँ हम लोग उनको मंथली बेसिस पे ग्रुप में बुला के उनको मेडिसिन से देते थे और जो हमारे अस्पताल में नहीं आ पाते थे हम लोग उनको तीन महीने की दवा प्रोवाइड कराते थे ये अचानक से जब लॉकडाउन हुआ तो उसकी वजह से उनकी मेडिसिन से छूट गई और उनको गाँव से आने के लिए जो पंचायत थी अगर उनको पंचायत लिख के दे देती थी कि आप लोग अस्पताल जा सकते हैं तो वहां से वो अगर अपने ग्राम पंचायत से निकल के आ जाते थे जैसे ही वो ब्लॉक में पहुंचते थे वहां पुलिस उनको नहीं आने देती थी तो उसकी वजह से भी बहुत सी हम डेथ नहीं रोक पाए और उसमें उसमें जो हमारी वो थी उनका मैं फिर इंडिविजुअल भी कुछ इंटरव्यूज लिया हूँ मेनली uh, Uh, the my study reveals that there were severe restrictions imposed on uh, accessing care though we didn't have many covid deaths during the first round of uh, the first wave but then there were many other deaths which could could have been ever averted uh, if there were no travel restrictions so we uh, and many people couldn't come out of their village and access healthcare as a result many Uh, other causes of mortality increased significantly during the period uh, jo mera tha fir usme jaise hum isko agar isko hum dusre se tulna karte hain ki jaise 1920 ka hum apne hi jss ka aankda lete hain to usme 303 deaths hui thi aur jo iske comparison mein 2021 mein hamari 313 hui matlab 313 deaths hui so there were around 313 deaths in this period uh, yeah uh, to jitni jo 313 deaths hui to usme maine jo hai usme 15 interviews uh, liye alag se ki unko kya problems hui face karne mein uh, jaise usme se hum logon ne kuch apni reports mein bhi dali hai team to usme ek aisa milne ko mila ek bachchi hai salini karke to usko ye naam badla hua hai वो ढाई साल की लड़की है अचानक मतलब हमारे जगड़वांदा एक विलेज है जो इंटीरियर एरिया में है तो उनके माँ बाप लोगों ने उन आस पास के पड़ोस में भी बहुत सी मदद मांगी कि मेरी बच्ची को अस्पताल लेके जाना है आप गाड़ी दे दीजिए तो उनको दो से तीन घंटा वहां लगा गाड़ी ढूंढने में लेके नहीं मिला फिर वहां से वो लोग खुद ही उसको साइकिल में लेके वहां से जो नियरेस्ट अस्पताल है पी खुड़िया तो वो उनको वहां ले जाने तक दो घंटा लगा फिर वो अस्पताल में अपनी बच्ची को लेके गए वहां नर्सेज और जो थी उसने बोल दिया कि हम आपकी बच्ची को नहीं छुएंगे लेकिन दूर से ही इसका इलाज करेंगे क्योंकि अभी गाइडलाइंस नहीं आई है तो वो जैसे ही वो अस्पताल पहुंचे फिर उसकी माँ को लगा कि मेरे बच्चे को ये नहीं छू रहे हैं और उन्होंने उसको पैरिस्टामोल की सिरप दी और उसको घर भेज दिया और जैसे ही उसके घर पहुंचे तो वही उसकी विद इन थ्री आवर्स में उसकी डेथ हो गई तो ये देखने को हमको मिला कि अगर उस बच्ची का वहीं पर कोई चिकित्सक अच्छे से उसका इलाज देख लेता तो उसको निमोनिया था अगर वहीं पर उसका अच्छे से ट्रीटमेंट हो जाता तो शायद वो बच्ची बच जाती हरेंद्र मैं आपसे एक रिक्वेस्ट है कि थोड़ा संक्षिप्त में आप इसका रिचोर्ट बता देंगे ताकि अगले सत्र में हम जा सकते हैं ठीक है ठीक जी वेरी ब्रीफली Uh, there was this case of a two and half year old girl who could uh, 
there was a lot of delay in taking her to the hospital and uh, that we lost a lot of li uh, crucial time and in the hospital also she didn't get proper treatment and as the health provider said that there are not uh, adequate guidelines that have come up and as a res and she was given very basic paracetamol and and sent back home and she lost uh, uh, her life in in some period and this uh, shows how uh, deaths could have been averted uh, uh, in, uh, and how uh, it has impacted people's lives. Yes, uh, we have stories in the reports in which there is TB, HIV, RSD, or maternal, newborn. So, we have taken some 50 interviews in this report. And the in 2021, the COVID has affected the second wave. We of 2021 का एक और फिर 21 22 में जो पहले कोविड से पहले की क्या स्थिति थी और कोविड के जब आया तो फर्स्ट वेव में क्या थी और सेकंड वेव में उसका क्या है तो उसका एक निचोड़ देखेंगे अभी जो अप्रैल से जून तक का था हम लोगों का कोविड का बहुत काम बढ़ गया था जिसकी वजह से रिपोर्ट उतना अभी बना नहीं है फिर भी आधा रिपोर्ट बना है और जो रिपोर्ट अभी बनी है उसमें गवर्नमेंट का डाटा मेरे को अभी 2021 का नहीं मिल पाया क्योंकि वो लोग भी अभी कोविड में ही व्यस्त हैं so uh, there were around 50 such important case studies that we have developed and collected enormous amount of data. I want to continue this work and build up on the learnings from the previous lesson. In the first, uh, though in the first wave, there were not many COVID deaths. This, uh, in the second wave, there were so many more cases. I want to also bring uh, those into our, uh, my analysis and present results. As we all understand due to the COVID period, a lot of challenges and delays were there in data collection process. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Thanks. Dhanyavad Harendra, Kafi, Apka Kam, Sunke Ham, Pohoti, you know, Bahatupur Nikam, hai or Age, Apke report ke Levi, Ham, Pohotu Sukhe, or Kafi Sikhni Kau Milahe. I think so you have done a tremendous job and then. Uh, it's not very easy working in those uh, areas and then, you know, picking up these issues. And we wish that you will continue to do this. And uh, thank you once again. Uh, Arijit, would you like to uh, announce the, the next uh, award, uh, fellowship awardee? Uh, yes, first of all, I would like to thank Harindraji for that uh, riveting account of the work he has conducted in the past one year. So. While you were speaking, uh, I was going through the chat box and some a gentleman had used the word militant research to describe uh, the work you are doing, uh, which I think is very appropriate. And actually, it fits very well to the idea behind uh, the introduction of this fellowship, because uh, this research, people have this idea that the research is basically uh, sitting in your office or sitting in your room and just uh, in a, with a pile of books. But that's not the case. Your research is actually supposed to be a part of the larger process of developing the analytical tools, which uh, actually serve to finally uh, subvert this system, which is rotten to the core. And that is the agenda behind research. Uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, Harindra again. And uh, uh, without wasting any more time, I would like to call upon, uh, I'd like to hand the mic to uh, Shilpa Jain, who is the award, uh, who is the recipient of the Dr. Amit Singhupta Fellowship of the year 2021. Uh, Shilpa, are you with us? Yes, hello. Hello. We can hear you, Shilpa. Yes. It's on your video also. Yes. yes. Hello, Saroji. Hello, everyone. I am Shilpa from Madhya Pradesh. Uh, I am associated Bharat Gyan Vigyan Samiti for the last 15 years. 
glad that I have been selected for the Amishan Gupta Fellowship this year. As a part of the fellowship, I will be working with the aggregated health social health activist Asha. Uh, Asha are the backbone of the health system at the community level. Uh, in a community level in India, working is a part of the national health mission. We have uh, over a million ushers working in both rural and urban in India. The program in conceptualized ASHA not as the work of the health system, but as a bridge between uh, uh, supply side and the demand side. These ushers are community volunteers, not regularly. Regularly paid by the health system, health, de health department, but they get performance based fixed incentive for a specific kind of the action as decided by the health mission. Being the frontline worker at the community level, they are facing different set of challenges. Uh, as, a, as part of the Amishan Gupta Fellowship this year, I will be doing an action study to understand the situation and challenges of ASHA around health, uh, knowledge, uh, works, gender, economic, critical, critical issues, especially during pandemic and the solution and ways forwarded for the same. The study proposes to cover around 50 ashas uh, from both urban and rural areas of Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh state. The study will also include their families, trainers, facilitators, block and uh, uh, district level uh, program managers, uh, health system action connected to uh, local body uh, representatives and so on. Knowledge emerged out of the study can be used for improving the overall outcomes of the ASHA program. Since I am uh, one of the state level trainer, trainers of ASHA program, myself, it will be uh, relatively easy for the understand and uh, support to save level these issues in a pandemic uh, sorry, uh, uh, these issues uh, in a proactive manner thank you thank you yes. shilpa yeah yeah rigid yes sir thank you very much uh, shilpa and uh, now I would like to call upon uh, Comrade Sarojini uh, for continuing. Thank you, Arijit. And I should also thank Indranil for you know, uh, doing the translations, which is very useful. Uh, congratulations, Shilpa. And it is an important issue. And we know what is happening in the last 15 days, the kind of uh, the you know the issues the ashas unions are raising uh, about regularization and increase in the incentives and uh, this is a topic which you know I, I'm sure like we all will look forward to your uh, work uh, with this fellowship I'm sure you know the ashas uh, struggles uh, will see some success very soon 
and uh, uh, we are all with you, uh, with all the Ashas. Ashas are the frontline workers uh, uh, who are not regularized uh, and then do all the work uh, at the community level. And then, which is again an incentive based kind of thing, which is uh, very, very unfair in the entire health healthcare system structure. So, uh, we really look forward. Uh, and um, any in, any you know uh, uh, inputs or any uh, literature, any uh, you know other studies, we will definitely share with you, uh, uh, Shilpa. And uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, it 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 will be you know uh, an honor to have you doing this work for us. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, so with this, I would like to uh, you know uh, conclude the first part of the. Uh, program today. Uh, uh, now we will move on to the, uh, the panel, uh, which is on intellectual property rights and COVID-19, trading away access to healthcare. And I would like to invite Lena, Lena Minghani, uh, who's a global IP advisor, MSF Access Campaign. We are all familiar with our work. Uh, and uh, uh, her area of work and expertise is on right to health, innovation, drug regulation, and intellectual property. Uh, she worked extensively on the People's Campaign for the Inclusion of Public Health Safeguards in the Patent Bill 2005, as its provision seriously affected the production of affordable generic drugs and its supply to the developing world. More recently, as, uh, uh, as part of the MSF Access Campaign team, she has worked on addressing legally challenging monopolies of the multinational pharmaceutical industry that prevent access to generic drugs and more affordable vaccines. Uh, combining her expertise on rights and IP, she works with communities to address regulatory barriers in India to encourage supply of low-cost generic medicines and other health technologies to MSF's medical projects and developing countries. Uh, uh, we welcome you, Lena, and then uh, uh, and I will hand over it to you now to moderate the discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Sarojini, and to People's Health Movement. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, so for the next few minutes, uh, say 40 minutes, I'm going to be moderating a discussion on monopolies or intellectual property in COVID-19. I'm going to request all panelists to switch on the uh, videos at least to start with, so we can start with the panel discussion. Um, so I just wanted to sort of highlight uh, one very key point that we are here discussing about pharmaceutical monopolies and COVID-19. About 20 years ago, when I started work, I met Amit when we were working on um, intellectual property monopolies of, you know, what we call in layman's term, cattle monopolies uh, on HIV and cancer medicines. And at that point of time, he was an advisor. Uh, he was on the IP working group of Medicines Sans Frontières. Uh, and we, we developed a very close association in challenging uh, the patents on, on HIV and cancer medicines. But most importantly, I think, um, to pay homage to Amit and, and to remember him uh, is, the, is the fact that millions of people living with HIV actually hold antiretrovirals in their hands and put the pills in their bodies that allow us to live very healthy lives because in 2005, Amit played a pivotal role in getting um, the right to challenge patents into the Indian patent law. And that actually laid the foundation of the battle of AIDS activists to go to the patent office to challenge pharmaceutical monopolies. And today, millions of people around the developing world uh, are receiving generic medicines produced in India, but also in, 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 in other countries. Um, and what we see today is, is a sea change in the way we viewed uh, COVID-19, uh, sorry, uh, HIV AIDS. Um, so it's, it's particularly uh, emotional to be talking about COVID-19 without Amit, because we probably could have you know, um, worked, all of us could have worked together on COVID-19. He, he built that solidarity. He made us one tribe. He brought us together uh, despite our principal differences. So I'm going to invite um, Vinita Bal uh, to switch on her camera, if, uh, if I may, so I can introduce her and ask her the first question of the panel discussion. Yeah. 
so pleased to see you vinita <laughs> um so vinita is an immunologist and uh, i was very excited to realize that she actually has expertise in t cell biology so you know this is exactly you know the kind of questions you would need in covid 19 um she's she has a long association with the health movement and she's been uh, at the national institute of immunology she's a uh, faculty today uh, at the indian institute of science education and research and my first question to you vinita is this that what do you see global globally is a polarization of the debate on biomedical innovation um uh, some uh, developed countries and the policy makers are insisting backed by pharma um that uh, biomedical innovation uh, cannot work without intellectual property that's a key driver of biomedical innovation for pandemics uh, and we should have a stronger intellectual property regimes um and of course you know that uh, south africa and india have asked for the waiver of all intellectual property for pandemic related medical products so what in your opinion drives uh, you know medical research and and what are the drivers of medical research yeah uh, thank you lena and i'm very happy that i am one of the uh, participants in in today's program and i will take a small detour because after all it is Uh, amit's birth anniversary and uh, unfortunately one of the urban naxos have passed away but we do need to continue our struggle many of us have been part of that support system in uh, lesser or more uh, better fashion for the urban naxos and that also needs to be remembered and continued and let me say a few words about amit i actually remember i used to be in delhi i was part of a women's group called saheli and first time i ever met amit was in saheli office and many of you might have seen the condition of saheli office it is not one of the most pleasing places to meet but i was quite impressed by what amit was saying and thereafter that was the early days and thereafter in many other fora i kept bumping meeting uh, amit and of course there was a friendship which got established and i also remember discussions and what we call uh, used to call as uh, science group in delhi where there would be exchange of various issues and of course kamardari which developed over the years now that i am in pune Uh, and also amit is not there so i don't know what what happened to the science group but nevertheless so it, it in, instead of talking about his expertise in itr i thought i would give this personal touch where i met him personally and we became friends in fact during this pandemic period or just preceding the pandemic period uh, i lost two good friends and both of them were in different circles who moved in different circles in the uh, area of uh, public health both had extensive expertise and their inputs in the pandemic would have been really really invaluable for policy making as sarojini also said earlier lena also mentioned and we know uh, that and of course one one of them was amit and another one was a senior pediatrician public health expert and uh, uh, what what happened uh, was uh, i i do feel the loss about a year ago uh, when pandemic started i was i shared this with my close friends and of course we agreed that both of these people in different ways would have been so important in today's a situation and even now 15 months later i continue to have the same opinion i'm sorry i uh, went on a diversion but it is not possible not to talk about amit before getting mm. into the details uh, so about the biomedical research and uh, well yeah there i may have a slightly different opinion from what is a prevailing notion that there has to be a very strong ip drive uh, ip regime for for uh, good research in my opinion actually uh, the uh, academic research biomedical research in uh, and innovation associated with it i would locate it primarily in india because my experience has been primarily with uh, in india but good science drives any research innovation 
and it is nothing to do with uh, only industry there are many academicians who who are very keen on uh, pursuing areas of their interest and quite often uh, the the innovation is a byproduct of what they are doing and that is why uh, sometimes it's very hard, especially in academia, to do a focused research, which say, for example, tomorrow will help in preparing oneself or preparing ourselves for an, the next pandemic, which sounds like a very disappointing statement possibly, but I don't think uh, academic research is, is can be focused. Pharmacy-based uh, research can be more focused but not academic research in biomedical field, as I would uh, put it. So in, in that sense, but one has to remember that during current pandemic, many scientists globally, as well as in India, reoriented themselves to do research, which would be useful in the pandemic. And of course, it was not pre-planning. So it felt like there was a delay in their initiating these research, but at the same time, we have we needed diagnostic, we needed cheaper uh, measures for uh, diagnostic uh, facilities and so on. I wouldn't say Indian scientists have actually come out with the products, but there was government funded research which encouraged such biomedical innovations and uh, albeit, as I said, they began late, they were not in anticipation of the pandemic, but the pandemics normally tend to continue for two, three years. So in some sense, even their research would be contributing to uh, managing pandemic rather being uh, focused on pandemic preparedness. So that's the distinction that I would like to make. And uh, maybe in a uh, little uh, later, if there is a possibility, I would also like to talk about what the plans are, because this pandemic, as you know, um, the development of repurposed dr drugs was fast. There was all, relatively speaking, not that we have great repurposed drugs for uh, uh, taking care of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there were also very rapid, relatively speaking, very rapid development of vaccines. And that also, in a sense, was useful. So uh, this is something that has contributed to, uh, I again, calling it pandemic preparedness is not necessarily the best option to best usage of the word, but still, I feel what was the, the experience of scientists about MERS and SARS, which were there in the last 20 years, which uh, they, that had helped, that has helped. And in less than 200 days or uh, in about 200 days, there was a vaccine which was made available. Even this was a phenomenally rapid progress, but it seems we probably need to be even better prepared. And what are the plans for that uh, is something that maybe I would, I would talk about it in, uh, yes. later because I remember you had told us not to talk too much. I'm sorry about it. Thank you. No, I'm going to come back because you use very exciting words about plans ahead. So that's obviously something that we are all interested in. Um, so I'm going to ask Dr. Soon Kim to also switch on her camera. Um, and, and, you know, I'm going to take up some of the uh, things that, you know, Vinita said as we go ahead, uh, establishing the background to this discussion. Um, so I'm just going to introduce Dr. Soon Kim. And I hope I can see her. I can't see her. Um, so I would very much like to, you know, uh, uh, see her while, while I'm introducing her. So I'm just going to um, sort of look. She's, she's there, Lina. Oh, great. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so Dr. Sun Kim um, is based in uh, Seoul, South Korea. Uh, I watch a lot of South Korean uh, serials, I have to tell you this. So I'm, I'm very excited to actually meet her uh, along with uh, my son. And uh, I just wanted to say this, uh, that when I went to South Korea, I met a lot of activists and researchers, and I was completely blown by the kind of work that South Korean uh, um, uh, institutions and, and uh, companies were doing on diagnostics and biologicals. Uh, so Dr. Sun Kim is currently the director of Health Policy Research Center uh, at the People's Health Institute in uh, Seoul, uh, South Korea. Uh, her interest lies in uh, looking at uh, production, uh, pharmaceutical production. 
uh, and how it can be aligned to health uh, and, and, and politics. So Dr. Sun Kim, uh, if I may ask you, uh, my question to you is this, that looking at the tremendous investments and support that the South Korean government has given for both research and production, uh, where do you see this uh, uh, support and investment being aligned to, to people's needs in developing countries? And do you think uh, they make uh, treatments and diagnostics and biological medicines and vaccines more affordable for people in developing countries? Um, and what needs to change if that is not happening? Oh, thank you, Lina, for the question. So can, you can hear me well now. So uh, to respond to the question briefly at first. So for the last year during this pandemic, uh, PH in Korea has published several issue briefs. One was about all kinds of public support, either financial or regulatory to the COVID-19 diagnostic kits industry. And one was about the public funding of the R&D of the COVID-19 therapeutics and vaccines. And the last one was about the public contract manufacturing facilities for biologicals uh, that are producing the COVID-19 vaccines, either for vaccination program or for clinical trials. And with scrutinizing all these, we found out that there was severe lack of democratic public control over the public sector, uh, as well as the private sector. And that uh, this led to the public resources uh, to the public and private sectors not to serve to the equitable availability and affordability for the vulnerable at local and for the low and middle income countries. So South Korean government has never officially supported uh, the TRIPS waiver, nor the CTEP, the technology pool. And we are uh, here, uh, PH in Korea has been relentlessly, relentlessly uh, insisting that not only for the South Korean people, but also for everyone, everywhere, uh, all the COVID-19 technologies, which are being heavily supported uh, by all kinds of public measures uh, should be equitably provided. And uh, sharing IP and know-how either regarding the development or production of the technologies would be the first step uh, of it. And we believe the intervention uh, by the PH in Korea could ensure uh, the government and the companies to be more accountable uh, with more public control over uh, the industry itself. And I can provide the problems in detail further <laughs> if needed regarding the lack of uh, public control over the industry. Yeah, so uh, just a couple, just to add to what you just said, and maybe you want to respond to, to what I raised, is that, uh, you know, Gopa's also here, and, you know, some people maybe from the women's movement are here. Some of us got together to work on a biological medicine called Trastuzumab or Herceptin, um, which was Roche's monopoly till, till a few years back. And uh, we were contacted uh, to a surprise by South Korean companies who said they could produce uh, trastuzumab. They had already produced it, but were waiting for the patents to expire. Similarly, for the uh, pneumonia vaccine, um, you know, companies contacted Medicine Sans Frontières saying, we, we are ready to produce the PCV-13, uh, but we are blocked by Pfizer's patent on PCV-13. Um, Despite these experiences, South Korea continues to, to you know, support a very strong intellectual property regime. What do you think we can do to change that about uh, uh, COVID-19? One, because uh, when it comes to biological medicines, South Korea is, of course, a very important manufacturer. So, you know, what can we do in the movement to, to support your work at, in the People's Health Movement to sort of change uh, South Korea's position on intellectual property? So it is quite hard to answer the question. We have uh, been struggling to persuade the, the government as well as the public that uh, waiving IP is not the, a bad thing for the South Korean companies or industry or the people or the government, but a good thing 
for the for the South Korea as well as the world as a whole, especially during this pandemic. But uh, one thing is that it is a kind of ideology, a kind of uh, beliefs, especially by the government of officials in the government. Uh, to believe that we should protect the IP, especially under the context that some of the South Korean companies are developing their own vaccines or therapeutics. And even one company, the South Korean, has uh, already developed their own therapeutics, uh, one, one, one therapeutics uh, uh, already. And even though it is not that effective for the treatments, uh, the, the company and the shareholders of the company and the South Korean government, uh, which uh, has uh, 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 supported the, the development of the uh, therapeutics so much, uh, are just um, concerning about the, the negative impact after waiving the uh, IP of COVID-19 technologies, especially with this specific uh, technology, and then any kinds of uh, future uh, possible impacts to the South Korean companies. And as well, uh, even uh, because uh, the, the South Korean industry in the past with regard to the small molecules, we didn't see that uh, kind of uh, advantage, competitiveness of our company or, or industry or our country uh, better than other countries. But under this biological uh, industry, the era of the biologicals, uh, the government and the industry and the companies uh, has have found out that oh, we may be a kind of leader of the world in this sector, as uh, the, the biologicals industry doesn't need that uh, big uh, population to. Uh, to meet the meet demand of the market, or it doesn't need to uh, the, the, the have that uh, big uh, size or scope of the, the plants. So uh, one, one thing is the ideology and the other one, we may uh, need some kind of proofs or something like an example from especially not from the low and middle income countries, but from the one of the high income countries that Waving IP or shaping uh, IP or know-how could be a good thing for the the people in their local setting, for uh, the for um, uh, for solving the problem at the local as well as the global. So we uh, in South Korea, PH in Korea has uh, shed light on the the fact that the Spanish government and its National Research Council. Uh, has pledged uh, to support the CPAP as well as to uh, share their know-how with regard to the COVID-19 technologies. Thank you so much. And May. Yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> so, and May, in that uh, sense, uh, we may think about any kind of possible solidarity movement with others abroad. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So I just would like to sort of highlight that um, there are old alliances between South Korea and India activists because we fought for imatinib and the nibs played a huge role in cancer treatment and uh, I also like to sort of play, pay tribute to Hisog who passed away from cancer this, this year and he, he was just such an immense force in, in South Korean civil society. Um, I just wanted to sort of come back to your uh, discussion about uh, the role of South Korea uh, in, the, in the whole issue of manufacturing and, and as we move forward and probably come back to when you spoke about ideology and we're going to touch upon ideology with, with the fourth speaker. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Hani Sirag uh, to put on his video and hopefully he'll put it on before I introduce him so that you know everyone can see him when I start the introduction. So um, Hani Sirag has been associated with the Pe People's Health Movement for a very long time. Uh, he was the convener in 2009 and now is on the steering committee. Um, uh, Hani is, is, is someone who's uh, in the Department of Internal Medicine in the University of Texas in the United States and perhaps is watching firsthand what's happening in the United States. Um, and I'd like, him, uh, I'd like to invite him to switch on his video. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lina. Um, yeah, great. 
Um, so, uh, honey, you just heard uh, Vinita uh, talk about 200 days and we've got a vaccine. And my question to you is this, that uh, the current issues about inequity, the response, for example, of the UK and Canada um, and uh, the EU is charity, is donations. We've solved the problem with, you know, pledges and donations. Um, do you think that this is an equitable solution to the issue of shortages and disparities on the uh, C-19 vaccines? And what can social movements do about it? Because we are at a point where we've just been hit by, by um, the COVID wave in Nepal and India. We're watching this happen in, in Africa. And of course, we've seen that in Latin America as well. And we've seen huge disparities, for example, in the United States, where you know, they're starting to, to vaccinate adolescents why we haven't even vaccinated the, the, the elderly and healthcare workers in, in many low-income in, countries. So do you think that the issue of charity and the issue of donation will solve the problem and more money to COVAX will solve the problem in inequitable uh, distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lena. I, um, I would like as well to, to take um, two minutes to talk about Amit in the, in the beginning. Um, Amit for me is a is a very close uh, uh, friend and somebody I worked with him for a very long time. I knew him since year two thousand, when we were in uh, in, in Savar in Bangladesh for the uh, first uh, People's Health Assembly, and I would say since year two thousand six, we we worked together very closely and i would say for for many many years we've been on on daily communication amit for me is is a teacher a very close friend and a comrade who continued to defend people's right to to health to medicine and to decent lives in in in, in his life um, it's very emotional to talk about intellectual property right without Amit being with us. We learned a lot from him in, 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 in this topic. Amit contributes significantly to people's health movement through his writings, his mentoring uh, um, many, many uh, uh, people, including myself. And we achieved a lot with, with, with Amit. And I think that without Amit, the people's health movement couldn't be that uh, uh, large and that um, popular in many uh, uh, countries. So thanks Amit for everything you did for us. Back to your question, uh, uh, Lena. Of course, it's not. It's not. Uh, uh, it's very far from uh, equity uh, when we talk about um, the, the 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 donation and uh, uh, charity in in distribution of the vaccine. But this is not very uh, uh, surprising if we um, recall. The, the whole setup of uh, um, global health and health systems um, and many other uh, uh, things under the, the current dominant uh, um, ideology and uh, um, uh, governance in, in, in global health. So the idea here is, should we accept this or not? And what are the alternatives if we do not, as people, if we do not accept this? And this is for me the main, the main issue. So the, the way I understand it, it's, it's, it's the whole, this is, cannot be separated from the uh, economic uh, governance and the um, capitalistic uh, regimes. So we cannot separate uh, this and we cannot expect that the distribution of the vaccine or the dealing with COVID-19 is going to be separate or is going to be uh, uh, something different. We are seeing the same thing. We expect that Pfizer uh, and Biotech are going to have $26 billion sales 
out of COVID-19 vaccines. And Moderna will have around $19 billion sales. So this is the very classic case we are uh, 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 facing. So what are the solution? The solution is public production. If we continue negotiating with these companies to try to reach somewhere in the middle, we will not. Because if we want to have equity in health, this means that big interests need to be challenged, need to be changed. We will not reach somewhere in the middle. It doesn't work for me. So how to, how to have public production? This needs models, needs examples, needs lots of investment, public investment in these, in these areas. So, so honey, I'm going to uh, interrupt you now and ask you this very important discussion that's happening between the North and uh, South at the moment. Um, a lot of uh, uh, Northern policymakers and activists are talking about, let's go out and get the technology from Big Pharma and you know, uh, the US and, and developed countries. While you're talking about models of local production, models of using local science, and you know a greater role from governments in in the south to to you know sort of boost um, local production of vaccines and therapeutics that we need. Has this happened in the past? Have we done this in the past? And do you think we can do it for COVID nineteen? Well, in in the past we have experienced that instead of just to continue negotiating the waiver of I, I, IP and uh, uh, negotiating different uh, uh, modes of prices. We, we, we have the, the, uh, uh, the use of flexibility of uh, trips by certain uh, countries. It was at a, at a very high cost. Things are changing and the govern these governments are not the same uh, as now. But I see the, the, the way to do that is to have more examples, to have more countries are using the uh, flexibilities of trips agreement without negotiating without discussions. The more we do it, the more we get used to it. So um, um, because here the negotiation is not equitable as well, as well because with the, the negotiation be, be between South and North, we are asking them to be better, to give vaccines to uh, 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 countries in the, in the South. This, this will, not, will not happen voluntarily because they do not have any uh, uh, pressure to do that except for the moral uh, drives, which I don't think we, we need to rely on that. So the idea, unless there are something more than moral drives, we will not uh, 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 move forward. And Absolutely. as you said, yeah. So I, when you said about pressure, that brings me, and I'm going to be coming back to each of you all who, who are in the panel, brings me to my fourth speaker, uh, um, Kem Gopa Kumar. And uh, we're going to pose uh, some of the elements of what certain uh, uh, Sun Kim uh, and Vinita and Ani have raised to uh, Kem Gopa Kumar. So if I can ask you to switch on your camera, that would be fantastic. Yes, yes, Lina. Excellent. So, um, you know, uh, Gopa promised to send a few lines. So I'm just, so he didn't. So I'm just yes, going to yes, make yes, them up. Yes, you I did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For okay, great. Time, no. So, so Kim Gopa Kumar is the legal advisor of the Third World Network. And in my words, I would, you know, sort of describe him as one of the um, smartest strategists I've seen uh, in the business of pharmaceuticals and intellectual property. Uh, he has had an immense impact on access to medicines with the work he's done with the Lawyers Collective, with the Third World Network and the People's Health Movement. So I'm going to pose my question to, to Kim Gopa Kumar. Uh, Sun Kim uh, basically said, uh, you know, ideology, intellectual property is ideology. And Hani basically said that we need pressure. So that brings us to the issue of the TRIPS waiver. And if you can sort of describe what the waiver is, but most importantly, if you can tell us do you think today, um, you know, intellectual property is more ideology than public policy? What do you think? Is it is it is it aligned to people, or is it all about you know, um, you know, 
post-truth. It's, it's ideology, therefore, we need to do it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lena. So before answering, um, uh, similar to all the previous uh, speakers, let me also take a minute or so uh, to uh, recall uh, uh, my personal as well as uh, organizational uh, or affiliation of working with uh, Amit. Uh, uh, so it's around more than 14 years and mainly we never uh, 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 meet in Delhi, but mostly meet outside and, and spend hours uh, together discussing various issues. Delhi meetings were always over phone. Uh, but one of the work Amit was doing um, around 2018 uh, actually, it started around 2013 as part of the Trastuzumab campaign and what really prevents the uh, generic production of uh, biologics. Uh, so, uh, 2018, there is a small booklet uh, written by Amit on biologics, uh, access to biologics. Uh, so, this uh, booklet uh, was for, uh, you know, discussed in, a, in, a, in an expert meeting in Geneva. Followed that meeting, the experts uh, around uh, seven scientists, uh, including uh, Dr. Satyajit Red, signed and sent a memo to WHO uh, to asking for a reform of uh, the WHO's biosimilar guidelines. So unlike small molecule, uh, the, when it comes to the approval of the biosimilar, that let us call it as a generic uh, biotherapeutics, uh, like trastuzumab, uh, etc. So the generic company is forced to do the clinical trials, and this involves a lot of money and time. Uh, so the uh, scientifically, there is not much backing for this kind of uh, you know regulatory prescription. So this was the most contentious event uh, uh, issue, and uh, this was followed up with uh, uh, the scientific memo. Uh, two months ago, WHO published its draft version uh, of the new guideline, and it said that uh, uh, phase three trials uh, will not be required uh, for a biosimilar guideline. There are more issues uh, to resolve there, but I think uh, now we are in a much more strong position if we push it uh, one more push jointly, I think uh, the rest of the uh, monopoly protective mechanism can go and it can be in a way, uh, you, you can say that, you know, you can democratize the uh, regulation of uh, biosimilar and it can enhance access. So this is one of his work he was doing, uh, you know, 2018 and the beginning of, uh, uh, yeah, towards the beginning of 2018. And uh, so this is in a way reaching a logical conclusion. And this was also initiated and he got into this work around 2012, uh, I guess, 2012 in a meeting organized by, again, MSF, TWN and uh, 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 JSA in, uh, in, in Delhi uh, discussing about access to medicine. Um, so this is sort of, uh, uh, I thought I'll uh, recall uh, the work I was doing and, uh, you know, it is somewhere the work is reaching the logical uh, uh, end. Uh, so having said this, uh, or definitely <clears throat> uh, intellectual property uh, is no more a, a public policy tool uh, but it is more, I mean, it is a public policy tool, but more of an ideology. Um, so if you look at innovation, there are many uh, tools uh, in your uh, toolbox uh, to induce innovation or to uh, realize innovation. As uh, Vinita already told that, you know, scientists is always uh, uh, driven by the uh, challenges or the scientific questions and not the uh, monopoly waiting for uh, he or uh, to, uh, you know he or she can enjoy later not that it is resolving the issues where the society might be uh, uh, waiting for or the scientific community might be waiting for so the, so there are various ways uh, in which a person or a company or a, um, a society we uh, try to resolve these issues. So there are various uh, tools for that. Intellectual property was one of the tools, which uh, in a way provides a monopoly uh, so that uh, the person who, uh, who can invest or the company can invest the money without the fear of uh, somebody else will uh, free ride on that and will reduce the uh, uh, that uh, or undermines that innovation. So this was the original 
uh, sort of or or what I would say that you know well solved uh, justification for uh, the protection of intellectual property rights. But we know that uh, what we read in theory does not work in practice. Um, so with uh, all its uh, justification, let us agree for the moment. But still, this mechanism often failed to deliver. Uh, so the pandemic is one of the important area where uh, the intellectual property rights cannot deliver in the past and in, uh, in, in the present uh, time too. As uh, Hani mentioned, um, if had it been patent or a intellectual property regime is the good tool to deliver and induce innovation, then there would not have been no need of a public fund funding for vaccines. All the vaccines, uh, around 95% of the public money, that is around roughly around $95 billion, went to the development of vaccines, you know, various vaccines. So that shows uh, the state uh, is the main um, driver of innovation. And, and having said this, but now uh, the, best, the first justification for innovation was that, okay, if you allow people to free rate, the money which I invested uh, would be undermined. So therefore, I need a patent protection or a, I need a monopoly. But now there is no such justification. There is no scope for such justification because it's a public money. It's a public good. But still, the companies nor the governments are not ready to give up that uh, uh, monopoly power. So that means there is something uh, uh, you know, else is the justification. So that is basically an ideological justification to protect patent and uh, protect patent or intellectual property regime. And one more sentence, I'll, I'll end, uh, Lina. Uh, during this process, in the last 30 years, there is an... Uh, concerted attempt to rewrite the history or erase the past history, saying that you know intellectual property is the only driving force for innovation. But historically, there is no evidence. And historically, there is no link uh, between IP and development. It is always people um, emulated the technologies developed by elsewhere and then moved to their own innovation and invention. So this is the value chain. And this is what happened globally throughout the history. But they want to uh, you know, erase that history by saying that IP is the only tool for innovation. So this uh, history is now being interrogated to the waiver demand and the support uh, it is getting from people as well as uh, the uh, members of the WTO member countries. Yeah. yeah, so just very quickly, and then I have to go to Vinita and look at questions as well. Um, what I really wanted to ask you, Gopa, is this, that it's on technology transfer. I mean, here, we heard a very heated debate about technology transfer. Um, you know, when I joined uh, the intellectual property uh, area, um, you know, the TRIPS agreement said, you know, this will facilitate technology transfer. That was the deal, you know. If you lock, talk about the agreement and the deal on the table was that you introduce the intellectual property system and technology will flow to your countries. Uh, for the for the diseases that that affect you, has that happened? And since that has not happened, and if that has not happened, are we justified in completely waving off all intellectual property, not just for COVID nineteen, but for all pandemics and perhaps for other uh, diseases of public and health interest? So, what what is your take on technology transfer? Uh, has the deal that was made uh, in the TRIPS agreement in the early nineties has has that promise been kept? I think uh, TRIPS came into force in 1995, so we are around uh, 25 years uh, down the line. So this is a good period to assess what was the promise and what we, uh, you know, or what did we get after 25 years. And if you do that stock taking, then I think uh, uh, this is a high time to uh, reform the in, uh, international intellectual property regime, uh, including the TRIPS agreement because it failed to uh, not only to uh, transfer technology to uh, developing countries, but also failed to bring the investment in the research and development to address the uh, health uh, issues faced by our own people or our own country. So now the uh, actually intellectual property regime uh, the, uh, through the TRIPS agreement, what did it do is that it prevented access uh, to substantial percentage of the global population to protect the profit of a few companies in a few geographical area that is in the north first and second 
it uh, completely dried up any kind of uh, R&D financing for the uh, uh, those kind of diseases which require long term research and which uh, also uh, is the you know the market is uh, with the people with the low buying or purchasing power so those areas they don't uh, uh, make, uh, uh, they didn't make any investment because the uh, the logic of patent regime is that i invest in rid then if i have the success i enjoy the monopoly i charge a very high price to recoup my past failures my present uh, rid expenditure and future uh, our money share for the future rid plus my profit so all this to be done from you know one single medicine and this is a high price okay this uh, if you develop a medicine for a tb if you charging that high price nobody is there to buy or even if a sickle cell anemia if you, you can have that innovation but nobody is going to access so these companies never bother to invest so we need to uh, uh, take up these issues and speak against this um, highly highly um, what you call a, a, a you know a oppressive regime uh, which 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 sort of uh, uh, you know uh, denying access uh, to the uh, uh, to, uh, not only medicine but the right to science you know everybody no. has the right to progress from the science and its application yeah. so that is being denied through the trips agreement so, sorry yeah yeah just sorry. a second yeah yeah just a second i just just wanted to go to vinita to, to uh, ask no, her before that i just wanted to flag like there is one question in the q and a it may be linked with the you know you are more i'll do it well, i'll take a look at it thanks yeah. <laughs> thanks so uh, coming to vinita and then i'm going to go take a look at the q and a and and really exciting discussion uh, you know uh, gopa saying rethink r and d and move it away from aligning with ip so i'm just going to ask you vinita you said plans and you know very exciting to hear plans because that means there's some public policy in the making but i just wanted to ask you this this question aligned to plans as well that a lot of people are talking about mrna technology and in the context of you know perhaps uh, that only the west can do it and you know developing countries just don't have the wherewithal to do it what do you think about that you know and and what are those exciting plans here yeah well first uh, answer to the mrna technology there is an indian company which is also making mrna based vaccine and that company is located in pune where i, I happen to live these days so it's not an impossibility even in academic fields this is being done so that's not something so in terms of technologies we i mean indian scientists or indian technologists are not that far behind and if you let me i would want to make three quick points and one of them is about future but uh, that's also based on the other points that i want to make the first one i wanted to make was about how india is talking indian government is talking with two faces it is challenging ip regime which is something that we are actually enthusiastic about that you know vaccine should be made available to everybody anybody and so on and so forth but at the same time this same government which developed the so called co vaccine that we know of in a, which was uh, the virus was isolated in one of the academic institutes in the country that was straight away handed over to an indian but a private sector company why was it given an exclusive license at that time why did we the, why was the government not thinking about non exclusive license now they are thinking about some public pharmaceuticals getting money for uh, and funding for producing the same vaccine that the bharat biotech is producing but this is sort of you know arriving late on the scene and so on but i wanted to say this because on one side this and on the other side that uh, the major fail one of the major failures in in this pandemic has been that if one takes who as quote and quote neutral territory i mean i i'm not going into the details of that but the solidarity trial covax all of these fell flat on its face in many instances because of you know non cooperation no money and very many problems which were there so do we need to strengthen those kinds of efforts is one point that i wanted to make without getting into the details but the second point is the, the uh, last point that i want to make is also that uh, there has been a a book uh, book or a report i should say 
which was released on 12th of June 2021. And it was about 100 days mission to respond to future pandemic threats. This is, this is a, a report which has come out and it is trying to uh, concentrate on reducing the impact of future pandemics by making diagnostics, therapeutics and vac vaccines available within 100 days of WHO or whichever agency actually uh, declares the pandemic or epidemic, whichever it is. So there are multiple details even in that report and I, without going into it, because it's hard to uh, go through it uh, because of the time, but I wanted to flag these points so that other, other people can read about it and or discuss it. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Vinita. I think we really need to have a session on the report and discuss, you know, how, how it goes. Um, there's an interesting uh, comment from Chi Kun, uh, who put it on Q&A and chat as well. And she says, of course, campaigning for intellectual property waiver is important. And she said, equally, you know, investing in indigenous or domestic production uh, is equally important. She highlighted how Cuba, despite being isolated, has done a tremendous job in, in, in producing medicines and vaccines. And having said that, I just wanted to sort of highlight uh, one of the uh, comments that uh, um, Honey uh, made, you know, I, I live in India and I've heard this many times um, that, you know, we should, uh, in the global movement of access, I've heard this many times, um, that a lot of effort needs to go towards convincing the companies to do technology transfer. And while you sort of, Honey, sort of highlighted the fact that perhaps we should just do it our way because it's, it's, it's almost impossible uh, to, to convince them. Um, so honey, you, you are basically saying that we take the longer route, uh, the more difficult route. And, and, and in, in some sense, what uh, Vinita said that, you know, we'll, we'll arrive at the mRNA vaccine. And uh, do you think uh, we'll lose too much time doing that? Do you think it's, it's just doable in, in by 2022? Uh, well, when, when, when the waves are coming one after the other. Yeah. I'm just being the oh. devil's advocate over here, just to, <laughs> yeah. Uh, th thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think that uh, what we're trying to do is to use their own tools to overcome the problem. So they are much more stronger than us when it comes to the protection of intellectual pr property rights. So this is the regime that they developed and we are using the same tools to get rid of it. So it's, again, it's as if we're trying to change from inside, which is something I do not believe in so much. We cannot use the same tools that the regime's having and try to change it. We can watch them, we can have tactics, but at the end, unless we have a different solution, it's not gonna work. And you asked about uh, uh, examples for that. One of it might not be very much inspiring, but uh, the, the, the example of Egypt of uh, um, dealing with hep C, I think it gives us lessons. I mean, the Egyptian government played a kind of a, a game with Gilead and they accepted to purchase the, the new medicine for hep C with $900 in the beginning, which still was very, very uh, high price for uh, uh, people in Egypt. But it ends up that Gilead was very relaxed and when they applied to have the license in Egypt, the paperwork was not completed and it was refused. But meanwhile, during this time, there was preparation for the local manufacture. manufacture. And right now, the uh, selling price of uh, uh, generics is around $20. So this reduces the prevalence of hep C from 15% in population from 15 to uh, uh, um, 55 to almost zero. So we're talking about something that happened. So the idea here, if we talk about the intellectual property right as, as uh, Gopa said, there is no evidence it did, it, it, it did uh, 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 this protection made difference in uh, uh, the innovation. 
And when we talk about the ownership of these companies to the, 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 the license of uh, um, a new innovation, this is actually a huge myth because if you look at production of any medicine, it does not depend on shareholders who are getting the money out of it. So at the end, if you look at it, who's, who's getting the benefits? It's not the scientists. It's not the, 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 the money that invested in by governments and public. It's not to uh, uh, the development of the science ac uh, across history. It's for share shareholders, you know? And a good example of that is Moderna right now. Who, who paid for the, the development of the vaccine in Moderna? Moderna is a very recent company, 11 years old. So it does not even have the long experience as Pfizer or others and had huge amount of public investment paid by taxpayers. And now they are selling the, the, the vaccine. So again, here, if we continue trying to change things from inside, I don't think it's going to work. And we need more compulsory license use, like what happened before in Thailand, in, in, in South Africa, Brazil, and the other. But the idea is to do it collectively. So the, the South solidarity is the main thing. It needs to be done on a very massive uh, 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 scale. And here we will win land and negotiation is going to be completely different. Everybody was expecting that this pandemic will, will offer opportunities for more equitable distribution. Uh, uh, life after uh, post pandemic will not be the same as before, but actually those who are putting the rules right now, those who are benefiting from, if you look at who paid the price of the pandemic, the poor. M not only in the South, but everywhere. In the US who paid the bill of people, people with, with, with color, the, 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 the poor and migrants. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to then throw out something that comes out from all of this. Uh, Vinita spoke about, uh, uh, Hani spoke about doing it uh, indigenously and domestically and Egypt doing it really well. Vinita spoke about the fact that uh, you've got a plan in place, uh, which needs to obviously be, be looked at. And then what I really wanted to sort of highlight is the exclusive licensing and the high prices. Today we are paying $10 uh, for uh, almost $10 uh, for each vaccination. Little, give or take a little more. I just wanted to ask, we pay a few cents for the other vaccine. So how much is actually pharma making? Uh, <laughs> if any of the panelists really, really want to answer, maybe, you know, uh, because the last I remember, the pneumonia vaccine was the most expensive vaccine that the Indian government had ever paid for, developing country governments had ever paid for, which was $10. And here we are paying an equivalent price for almost all the vaccines. So why we pay a few cents for the other vaccine. So how much is pharma really making and how much do we really need to also reduce costs and supply to you know, increase supply and reduce costs so we can vaccinate more and more people against the pandemic? So if anyone wants to answer that question among the panelists. But maybe, you know, Vinita, you want to, Vinita or Sunkim, you want to have a stab at you know, a manufacturer uh, who was talking to me said it'll be 10 rupees very soon uh, if, if there's competition. So what do you think of that statement? You know, are we paying $10 too much? Uh, are we, are, do we need to do more, more about the pricing as well and not just the supply? $10 is certainly too much because um, C uh, Serum Institute uh, chief Adar Poonawala had said that when 200 dollar or uh, 200 rupees I'm so sorry not dollars 200 rupees was the price at which Covishield the Indian AstraZeneca version was uh, being bought by the government there was 
no loss that he was in, uh, in, incurring. So obviously, even in two hundred dollar, uh, two hundred rupees per dose, there was some profit. And his argument was that they, this profit is not enough to invest further to expand the the basket that uh, Serum Institute uh, of India has. So that's another matter. But uh, that is why, as Gopa was saying, or somebody else was saying uh, that earlier, that are these moral ethical issues that we are going to impose on people or companies who are made for profit that looks ridiculous in a sense if they are made for profit they are private companies they are going to do what they are going to do so we need to put pressure so that their uh, profits come down is all that one can think of and the alternative is what i was suggesting uh, made a reference to earlier that public sector pharmaceutical companies which have been trashed in, in India 10, five, 10 years ago when Ramados was the health minister. At that time, three different, three or four different companies were simply shut down. And that is something that we are also paying for, that there isn't enough infrastructure. So whether it is uh, some vac pneumococcal vaccine or there, whether there is massive production of co-vaccine which is required, all of this could have possibly, possibly taken a different direction than where we are now. So, of course, it is history, but we cannot afford to forget this history. And I gather that Hafkin Biopharmaceutical, uh, which was one of those uh, companies which were also shut down, is getting funding from the government of India to sort of rejuvenate itself. How far it will go, whether it will be useful in this pandemic, if not, maybe in the next pandemic. I hope not, but I hope so, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so, so soon, Kim, coming back to you, and I, I see that there are lots of, uh, 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 you know, comments in the chat section. So please, you know, if there's a, is a question, please put up your hand. I, I'm finding it difficult to moderate and look at the questions. But I think, soon, Kim, I'm coming to you because you made this issue about governments looking at pharmaceutical production and research. It's purely industrial policy and not looking at it from the points of you know rights and access and of course healthcare and you know india and south korea seem to be following similar policies in the end domestically um so so what are some of the things that you think uh, we can do together as the health movement perhaps document it or any other uh, way that we can actually show the alignment between south korean and indian policy or in other countries versus uh, actually public access so at least in South Korean context, uh, I, I believe that most people do not aware about the existence, very existence of the public manufacturing facilities that are owned by the government. So even though there are several public contract manufacturing facilities, which are not the public uh, pharma, but the just uh, contract manufacturing facilities for uh, to produce uh, some biologicals or, or vaccines for the private pharma uh, based on the contracts with them. So uh, in South Korean context, we do uh, try to make the public aware about the existence and the industrial uh, drive by the government to make the, those uh, facilities only serve to the private profit, not for the public health need. And uh, we do try to uh, make the public aware uh, about uh, how much, uh, how many uh, 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 the, the uh, production capacities that they have and uh, how can we uh, shift those capacities not to uh, not to serve to the industrial purpose, but to serve to the public health need, and to uh, try to make uh, them imagine about the possibilities, another possibilities like in Cuba or in other countries with public manufacturing facilities uh, to make those facilities, those public facilities, to serve to the public health. So. Uh, Actually, the examples of India or other countries have been uh, kind of uh, uh, 
how can I say, it? some kind of hopes for civil society in South Korea to make the public aware about the, the very uh, possibility of uh, making that happen. Uh, and I see that some kind of, I, I heard from the, some of the Indian colleagues that the state-owned pharmaceutical undertakings in India have been some kind of uh, decreasing and some kind of lose, have lost uh, some kind of public attention uh, and has been lots of privatized uh, based on the, the neoliberal ideology by the uh, and drive by the government. But in South Korea, as the government and the industry sees uh, some kind of possibility to make the industry be prosperous, uh, be a kind of global leader in the bi biological industry, the government has been pouring lots of public resources <laughs> to build those kinds of facilities to uh, serve to the private industry. So we may kind of imagine some kind of possibilities to exchange those two very different or kind of opposite experiences between the two and make some examples to the the, the, the opposite side from the opposite side to public aware about some kind of another possibility. Absolutely, and I, I think almost I would just say this that uh, um, you know we need to unleash South Korea's power and in, in in biological medicines and vaccines. I've seen it firsthand when I went to uh, South Korea, and it was just tremendous to see that. And our struggles are in a way common between the South South issues even though South Korea, of course, uh, is, is a high-income country. Um, I'm just going to sort of well, throw this. Lena, we have yeah, there's, 10, 10 more minutes. And yeah. It's 7.45 now. Yeah, yeah. thanks. <laughs> I was just coming to Alexios. Uh, uh, sorry about, uh, you know, being tuddy on the, on the chat box. I just wanted to say that uh, Alexios sort of uh, highlights that, uh, you know, vaccines and medicines and diagnostics for COVID-19 need to be uh, public goods. Uh, has that promise been kept? Um, and, and Gopa, coming back to Alexos Benos's comment, uh, if, if you've seen it, uh, have governments kept that promise? And are they willing to, to, to negotiate on the TRIPS waiver? I think uh, it is more, as I said earlier, it is more of a uh, uh, more of an uh, ideological issue rather than an objective assessment. The public health uh, uh, informs us that you know we need to vaccinate the people at the shortest possible time uh, to reach a maximum number of people. Then only we can have the a kind of and hope for a. Uh, resilient uh, response to the COVID-19. But as of now, we know that we are running behind uh, all the um, uh, targets. And when the uh, vaccine producers, these monopoly companies, they are failing to fulfill their own promises of uh, you know uh, producing. They promised uh, uh, X number of uh, uh, doses uh, uh, in the month of March to be delivered. But they reach only 8% of what they promised and they are running behind it and but still not ready to uh, give up uh, the monopoly. So now uh, the, uh, there was uh, since uh, uh, 17th of June, there were five rounds of negotiation hap uh, happened and today also there is a negotiation. So it's became very clear uh, during the negotiation, what I heard from some of the negotiators is that, of course, it's I, I'm not privy to any of the ne negotiations, but as, uh, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a first-hand information from some of the negotiators is that it is the European Union which is blocking, and uh, US is sitting and watching the uh, game. The US said uh, we are ready to support the waiver, and uh, you people uh, talk it out. So it is basically EU is blocking and EU saying that the only barrier uh, uh, is a uh, compulsory license and then they have a three suggestions to move forward on that. These three suggestions are uh, already in the agreement. Okay, everybody follows that. Okay, there is nothing new uh, about it. Okay, uh, So it is the EU versus rest of the WTO membership. There are uh, uh, countries like South Korea or Japan uh, Australia, Canada, they, they, they don't like the idea of waiver, but they are less vocal uh, after the announcement of US support to the 
uh, waiver proposal, but U.S. support also limited to the vaccine. But U.S. has not opposed till date the extension of the waiver to cover other therapeutics or diagnostics. So as of now, mm, this is the state of play. The idea behind the European Europe's uh, um, uh, resistance is to delay the uh, any kind of decision on uh, uh, on waiver, and therefore by that time uh, either the waves may go away or uh, there might be some more products, more vaccines may come. So more vaccines will come from more companies, other companies. Okay, not from the monopoly. <laughs> they don't want to break the monopoly. Okay, they hope that more vaccine companies may introduce their products. Okay. So this is what is happening right now, and they are finding all kind of justification uh, to, uh, to scuttle the progress, uh, to have a, a consensus on this issue. Uh, I think uh, this is the time uh, there is a, what we, we, what we could see is that it's a people's power, it's a people's uh, 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 pressure, which uh, changed many countries' positions, including US, okay? This is a historic moment, okay? So if you continue to pressurize, I think you also will change uh, uh, in the coming days. And countries like India, they, as, as uh, Vinita pointed out, has a, a double stand. But uh, there is a historical reason also, like uh, past pressures and all playing that. But we need to pressurize and we, uh, we should ask the government of India to change its, uh, 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 this double stand and say, uh, <laughs> whatever, you know, whatever you are talking, you should uh, uh, do it uh, domestically. You know, you should do the walk the talk. Um, so that is what uh, we should uh, we should do. Yeah. Thank you, Gupa, for giving us a state of play and and pointing us in the direction of uh, mobilizing on on EU and particularly perhaps Germany, who's being very nationalistic about mRNA. Yeah, uh, there is a reason also. Just for a second, I just one sentence. It is the to... who invested behind the German vaccine. It is a German investment fund. Okay, so Absolutely. that is one of the reasons for. Uh, Germany's, uh, uh, you know, adamancy on to maintain monopoly over people's health. And, and oppose the waiver, uh, yeah. henceforth. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, sort of say this, that thank, I want to thank the panelists, but most importantly, I wanted to highlight that Zafrula has put out a very important uh, comment about collaboration among scientists in different countries, including Russia, Cuba, India, and of course, any other countries, Latin and, and other countries uh, where there would be more collaborative efforts. Zafrullah actually helped PHM host uh, the meeting in the, in the year that, you know, Amit passed away and they did tremendous work uh, to, keep them, to keep the meeting going. And, and, and I think in some ways, um, I, I remember the last minute uh, stress that, that just get the PHM meeting going. I would like to thank uh, every one of you as a panelist. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed someone's comment on the chat. It's really difficult to keep your attention here and look at chat at the same time. Um, so, so I don't fall into the categories of women who multitask, clearly. <laughs> so on that note, uh, and remembering Amit and uh, looking at Origi's eyes and, you know, just remembering Amit immediately. Uh, thank you so much for having me as a moderator. And I would like to thank all the panelists. And uh, if anyone has a burning question, please take it up with the panelists offline. Thank you. Uh, over to the organizers. Yeah. Thank you, Lena. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks, Hani, Sunkim, Vinita, and Gopa. A very insightful discussion. And uh, you have flagged many important insights, very relevant in today's context. Yes, global solidarity piece are uh, more important. And these discussions definitely resonate the vision of uh, Comrade Amit in the context of the topic of today. Uh, we will continue to carry forward uh, Comrade Amit's vision of strengthening the people's health movement and building these global solidarities. On behalf of the organizing committee, I request all of you to switch on your uh, uh, video, please. Uh, Tripta Naran, Tanushri Sengupta, uh, Raghunandan, Richa, Alka Narang, Indranil, Raman, and Gargeya. Uh, please switch on the camera. And I would also like to invite Comrade Arjit, please. And I thank all the panelists, moderator, Shilpa, and Harendra, uh, you know, who uh, were a part of the fellowship. 
and all the participants from many countries, irrespective of the time zones. That shows how much you know, Comrade Amit was in our thoughts and contributed to our moments. Uh, I salute uh, Amit. Uh, thanks, Newsclick, for all the technical support and solidarity. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, there are many, many interesting questions on the chat box, even in, on q and Maybe we can send them, Gargeya, to uh, you know, the panelists and to Dina. And uh, it's a very rich discussion. But at the end, I just want to you know, come back to the opening of uh, uh, the program. Uh, Father Stan Swami's death, it's a reminder of the inhumanity of the state. Uh, we need to convert today's grief with Father Stan Swami's death into a strong call for action and campaign for prisoners' health rights, demanding for speedy trials, granting of bail, and releasing those who have been granted bail with inmates of prisons in India to safeguard their health and health rights based upon public health and human rights principles. Zindabad. Thanks, everyone. We'll be uh, stopping the live uh, telecast soon.